I don't know, I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit like uh, a student in a famous Gary Larson cartoon, uh, who halfway through a lesson raises his hand and says, teacher, can I be excused? My brain is full. <laughs> because these two keynotes just, they're still with me. Uh, this was more food for thought than I would have liked at this point. But, but, maybe, but maybe actually you had an advantage because I saw your go out and there was a lot of talk. So maybe you did a bit of processing already of um, the many things that relate to 21st century skills that Michelle and Marie-Sophie have shared with us. And I was trying to think about what it is that we have in common because there are things that, that I've felt uh, we have in common. And I would mention two things. Uh, one is that we all are at a point where we feel the need to problematize, or I think the German word hinterfragen, 21st century skills. They're just words, really, in, in many ways, and there's so many of them, and they keep proliferating. Um, and the other thing that I thought, and you will see um, soon, we all three share, is the belief that language learning is a profoundly intercultural experience. And that's sort of a bottom line that I, I, I myself like to go back to when I think about what I do in teaching uh, and in training. So uh, as uh, Barnett has said, my name is Uwe Paul, and I'm German, and uh, I've been living in Hungary now for 23 years, 24 years. And my workplace is this unpronounceable in Hungarian, so Bernard said, Elte, Utvis Loran Tudomai Egyetem. I work as a teacher and teacher trainer, and uh, I have a sort of pretty personal relationship, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but I thought um, maybe a good moment would be for you to just put it up very quickly, to recall sort of a, a running list of 21st century skills. Could you just talk to the person next to you? We've had some help from Marie Zofie and I've just flashed it up. Can you just do a quick list of what kind of skills would you group under 21st century skills? Go. Turn to the person next to you. There should be someone on your side. It seems like this was a dangerous task for you to do. Yeah, I had a hunch. Um, I'm sure some of you are already starting to unpack those skills, or maybe you say, well, that's not a skill, uh, at least not for me. Well, here's just an open list of skills that I picked up from the conference program. And forgive me if the skills that you mentioned are not there, but my hunch is that at least a good number of the skills that you did mention are there. I think the, the fact that uh, this conference uh, chose the, this topic is no accident. Um, 21st century skills is now bandied about by politicians, people working in the economy, and educationalists, of course. Now, I would like to uh, say why for me the three reasons that I've become interested in 21st century skills and why they matter to me personally. The first one is indeed very personal because I have a daughter who's now no longer like that. <laughs> uh, so she's 24. And uh, so I have started to see her recently actually grapple with many of the things that, uh, that have been mentioned before. Some changes in the workplace and in life that are not only here to stay, but if anything, they will become more pronounced and they will bring very different challenges for her and more importantly, perhaps for her kids that I hope she will have one day. I'm also, as Bernard said, I mean, I'm a teacher trainer and uh, I work with beginning teachers mainly um, at the University in Budapest. 
And of course, we all ask ourselves the same question. What are we actually teaching? What are we training? Are we preparing our beginner teachers for this century? And when I go to other places around the world and some of the in-service work I do, I realize 21st century skills are already here as well. So wherever you go, this topic keeps coming up. So as an educator, um, I'm, I'm very interested in it. And there's a third reason which has to do with me being who I am in, in Budapest. Um, sort of a very funny cultural in between -y because I'm, I'm German, but I teach English and train English teachers in Hungary. <laughs> and I'm in good company. It was really comforting to see the statistics and to feel that. So actually, that's not a very special situation for many of you. But for me, um, it makes it interesting because it affords me a particular view on what goes in Hungary, on in Hungary and in teacher education in the schools. So I'm an insider now, after 23 years, and I'm an outsider. And I think for a good time, uh, this will be, re remain the case. So I'm very sensitized to some of the issues, some of the problems, some of the conflicts that, in my view, have a bearing on what's going to happen in the 21st century, not just in Hungary, but in the region. Now, you probably have started wondering about this guy um, and also about the zooming in and zooming out part. And before I come back to the guy, I would say that that was another thing I was happy to see in Maria Zafis, uh, or here, um, in her talk. Uh, zooming in, zooming out is a very useful thing to do. It's kind of a, maybe you could call it a, a mega skill. Uh, because it allows you to go individual in what I'm interested in, but also social to zoom from the individual that we're interested in when we're talking about those skills to the context within which these skills are required and played out and perhaps applied. Now let me introduce at this point, well, this is interesting. Uh, if you're German, you would call her Gabi. If you're Hungarian, you would call her Gobi. Uh, and the other nice thing about Gobi or Gobi is Gabriela, Gabriel, she can be she and he can be he. So Gobi or Gabi will follow us through my talk as a sort of a reminder of what we're really talking about. There's a, a real person somewhere that hopefully, from our point of view, will acquire the skills that we're talking about. So if we take that seriously, we would say there's Gabi, who's already a little personality and has certain features, some positive, some negative. Uh, she's beginning to find her identity. She's part of a family, she's part of a school. She lives in a society, in our region, anywhere really. But she's also, and I'm a little bit sort of at a loss for a good word, um, somebody who lives on this planet. Now, I was sort of tempted to say global citizen, but somehow lately global has become a difficult word to use confidently. So I was thinking for like earth dweller for the time being would be quite nice. Um, and it seems to me that 21st century skills, if we are serious about them being not just work-related skills, because sometimes it seems like that came out a little bit from um, some of the things that Maria Sophie was talking about. There's a push from the world of work to get ready the next generation of workers. And I don't mind that, but I think there is a bigger question, or there are bigger questions related to the social side of Gabi's life and how she will or will not relate to the challenges inherent in the world that she inherits from us. So what does Gabi need to do well in the 21st century, in the real world? And if we don't mean real world uh, only in the sense of the world of work, I thought it might be useful to go back to a, something that um, Ernst Friedrich Schumacher said a long time ago, I've always liked it, and now I know why I like it so much. 
Uh, and he has said it in a book, A Guide for the Perplexed. Maybe we need a new guide for the perplexed, but he's no longer around. In fact, that was his last book um, that he finished. And he says this, so just have a quiet read. You can see he was a special kind of economist. Uh, he was German, he, he lived in England, basically, uh, for the best part of his professional life. But he had a deep interest in the social dimension of life. And basically, Fermi contextualized the economic in the social. And I particularly like this phrasing, we were made or marred, we, we succeed or fail. Um, if we want to put it more strongly, from the point of view of our relationships with other people. It is true that in some ways, um, 21st century skills will ultimately, in reality, reside in a person. But I would argue that most of the problems that we're beginning to feel, and it's sort of just a diffuse feeling, if you're like me, um, that they're urgent, they're real, and they're here to stay. Uh, some of these challenges don't have to do so much with the individual, but with the forces that uh, start pulling on us the moment we enter a social domain, whether it's the family, school, society. So what, I, what would I like to suggest, um, and what will I want to talk about in some more detail? Well, I would like to put under the zoom lens the following things. And I'm not quite sure what to call them. For the, for the time being, I call them dimensions that, for me, cut across the 21st century skills. Sometimes you get to them by zooming in on the individual, and sometimes you get to them when you zoom out into the wider social and natural context of our life. And here they are. So the good news is it's only four. <laughs> okay. All right. Seeing the big picture. Well, the big picture, it, it doesn't get much big, bigger for people than zooming out to this. Yeah, so I think... Um, there's Gubby and another seven billion of us. And we're now at a very strange point in, in, in our lives. Um, geologists tell us this is the Anthropocene age, meaning it's the first time, really, where humans shape the planet more than all the other influences that geologists are usually interested in. And the funny thing is, this is sort of something that we, you know, we hear in passing, and we sort of maybe nod. And when you think about it, shaping the Earth is a nicer way of saying almost destroying it. Certainly changing it in a way that most of us wouldn't like to happen. Um, and it's also probably true for you, like for me, that unless you're personally involved, these changes are sort of there, in the background. But it's going on, this change. And for me, a moment, sort of an epiphany, really, was a very short while ago, this summer, when I wasn't very far from here, in Hinterglem. And it reminded me that I only really start waking up when I'm in the middle of this. So I was trapped with about 1,000 other people. Maybe you saw it in television here in Austria. Uh, because within three hours, after all this dry, dry summer, there was a downpour which basically cut off the whole hit Glen Valley. And it was very, very serious indeed. So we kind of become, for some reason, aware of the bigger picture only when something dramatic happens. Now, part of the reason is that Gabi, like you and me, is already very busy, even as a student. Dealing with school, dealing with the friends, dealing with the families. And it's very difficult for ourselves to kind of step back and actually make a link to the bigger picture and actually look for it and see it. So we need a bit of help. 
Now here's something I would offer. Because I think we would need help of the kind of, you know, developing new routines in the way we live and what we pay attention to uh, in the way that we brush our teeth, because we know it's good for us. Uh, global issues SIG of IATEFL, International Associations for, of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language, um, came up with something really nice. A calendar of, calendar of special days. <coughs> so what it does is it allows you as a teacher to regularly zoom out into the bigger picture perspective and to remind yourself and the students of some of those issues that have an impact and are likely to have an impact for a good while in this century. I'm not going to show you sort of exactly what days are there, but uh, as you heard, you will get the material. You can follow the link. But I did find it very interesting that International Stress Awareness Day is coming up. Did you know there was an International Stress Awareness Day? Okay. Now, what is very nice about this calendar of days is that it does two things. It focuses you and your students on why this is a big issue, and part of the big picture, going beyond you, maybe, and your friends and your family. But also, it teaches them English. So it's a very nice idea for how you can actually do this as you, because you are, at the end of the day, you're language teachers. Right? So you want to go back and the students need to feel that they're actually practicing or learning something concerning the language. So, I'm taking another risk, partly to get your energy back. Can you talk again to the person next to you, just for a moment, about maybe two things. One, do you think this would be a relevant topic to your students, stress awareness? If so, in what way? I'm not familiar with all your professional backgrounds and the kinds of students you teach, but you are. And if so, do you have just a, an idea, and you could just kick it around with the person next to you, what you might be doing, how you might get them to focus on stress awareness day, or some of the things you would quite like the students to get their teeth into. Okay? So, is this relevant? Any ideas for how? Go. Okay. Again, I need you back. I, I know this was another bad idea. I would invite you. I would invite you to put what you've been talking about into the ice box for now, and maybe take it out a little bit later. Uh, I'm sure there's some really good ideas that got started. So what we're really saying here is with zooming out is that in some way, I think it's partly from a teacher or teacher trainer point of view, our responsibility to find a regular way of reminding ourselves of the big picture issues and to find a local way in. And I hope you find some of those ideas at the uh, website useful for how to do this. I want to leave this particular point with one more example, which I found quite heartening. Um, there is a Green Schools initiative in the UK, and I'm showing it here partly because it's a very good example of how big issues, or the big issue of the, the environment is tackled, but also, as you will see here, that the teachers involved realize that problem solving and thinking critically involving students in big solutions can be done at a local level. You don't need to wait for something to happen much later in their lives when they're ready for it. So they're quite aware that this is possible and we can do it. Okay, number two, holding ideas loosely. I would like to start with this image because it's one of my favorite books um, that you, sh you see the cover of here, called Danube by Claudio Magris. Came out in 2001, I think. He traveled extensively in the late um, 80s and wrote a remarkable book about the region um, 
all the countries, the 10 countries, where you have the River Danube, all the way from the Bavarian forest through what used to be Austro-Hungary, the Balkans, um, down to the Black Sea. And Gabi is someone who lives in this region. And I think you would probably agree, it's a region fraught with historical conflict, which we've been lucky enough not to experience directly for a long time. But I'm no longer so sure uh, that we can guarantee it will stay that way. What's very nice about Claudio Magra's choice of words, he, ch he didn't call it the Danube. He called it Danube. Because in a way, the Danube doesn't belong to anyone. Okay. It's a shared um, value, really, in all the countries that it, it flows through. One of the reasons why our particular region is difficult is, it seems to me, and my insider-outsider perspective has, has taught me that, is that it seems like our histories are full of judgments which are contradicting each other. So one person's, one, one country's um, hero is the other country's villain. And there's what somebody recently called ressentiment, a glowing resentment that is still there, that's sort of bubbling under the surface and it seems to find more and more outlets these days. So for me, the issue of judging and judgment and the issue of opinion and views is a crucial one in this. One of the, one of the things that I find puzzling in Hungary is that, and, and the region when I, when I work and travel there, is that how is it possible that people who have never experienced some of those grievances are so adamant and emotional about them? And Part of the reason might be something called affinity bias. You tend to stay with and believe in things that people like you say. It could be in the family, it could be in your school, it could be your friends, it could be your country or your culture. This is an unconscious bias, like most biases really are unconscious. So affinity bias, being affin to a particular point of view, why does it matter? Well, um, I think Friedrich Nietzsche once said that uh, insanity is rare in individuals, but in groups and parties and <laughs> nations, it's the rule. <laughs> and that's the funny part, if you, from the point of view, you had a great way of using language. The less funny part is that sometimes now we can see how sanity becomes insanity fueled by a group and then turns into something very, very dramatic and horrible like the killing of Joe Cox, who was killed by a deranged man, but he was partly deranged as part of the, the very, very vociferous Brexit lot. Uh, she was a member of parliament and ironically, she was someone who was very proud. She was a Yorkshire woman and her husband wrote a book which I can recommend. <coughs> And he really makes the point that she was somebody who was rooted locally in her Yorkshire background, but also through her work in the world. So I think I would like Gabi to be able to think critically from the point of view to resist the siren voices that come from her peers or even from her family. I'm not quite sure how that can be done. Maybe this is one of the things that I'll come to in a minute, but particularly in our region, I see a great danger that we get a continuation of judgment and people find it really difficult to, what Magris called, to flank your judgment. Something is true and something else is also true. And there's a second part to holding your ideas loosely because I think, you, again, if you go back to your personal experience, one of the hardest things to do is actually to hold your ideas loosely in a discussion or argument. So if we talk about communication skills, what does that actually mean? What do you have to do to have a really good dialogue with someone? What needs to happen? Is it with him or is it with you or is it both? 
takes two to tango, as it... Um, can you learn it? And if so, when should Gabi start learning? How to hold her viewpoint loosely, to try and understand, and understand the, the, the value of a different viewpoint, and to negotiate it out. Now, I want to show you just a very short clip uh, that shows you can actually start very early. If you allow me, I might have to fiddle a bit to get it to the point where I'd like it to be. It's, the school is, is not very creative, it's school 21. But there's more than meets the eye, I can tell you that. Because these are really kids, primary kids. So let's see. These are young kids, and of course, then you can say they're, they're English kids, but it seems to me, as language teachers, this is something we can do too. I don't know exactly when you, with your students, might want to do that, but actually to get them into a culture of dialogue, discussion rather than debate, and to learn for them to listen, which is another important subskill of all this, and to hold their ideas loosely so that it can be called a dialogue. Uh, is something you can learn at any time in your life. It's never too late. And uh, you will find, if you go to the website, there's some interesting toolkits that some of you might also find useful or recast to fit your own students. Because students might need some guidelines with this. Okay? But the point is that, as in this school, you to think about how to roll this skills development into the regular class work that you do. So that Gabi learns how to relate to different cultures in, at the school. How to have a, well, a dialogue is really a democratic uh, tool. And uh, I'll never forget a school teacher in the UK, actually it was the headmaster, once said to me um, in Liverpool, uh, well, kids learn about democracy in a democratic school or democratic classrooms. Okay. So this, this culture can be developed in various ways, and I think school is a perfect site for this. Three, shifting perspectives. So we had the bigger picture. We had looking at holding your ideas, your viewpoints, your judgments loosely. And now we have shifting perspectives. Now, I'd like to introduce Shifting Perspectives with a short story, or rather the beginning of a story. It's one of my favorite stories. There were once two friends, a tadpole and a stickleback. And uh, they were born in the same pond. They became really good friends. They had a great time. They were swimming around, having fun. Now, one day, um, the stickleback, the fish, swam up to Tadpole and said, what's, what's this there? And he said, what do you mean, this there? Yeah, what thing sticking out of your body? He said, what are you talking about? These are my legs, stupid. He said, well, you can't have legs. You're a fish like me. So Tadpole said, I'm no fish. You know, I'm a frog. What? And of course, you, you can see where this is going because, you know, a week later, there would be hind legs and front legs and the tadpole was basically a frog and predictably left the pool, uh, the pond. And our friend, the Sigurdberg, was left all alone and very sad. Yeah, it's, up to this point, it's a sad story. But then two weeks later, he came back. There was a big splash and there he was. And his delighted friend, the fish, said, well, where have you been? I've, miss I've missed you so much. He said, well, well, I've been out there. Oh, really? Well, what's it like? I said, oh, fantastic. I mean, whew, that, come on, tell me, what did you see? He said, well, I saw so many things. But, for example, I saw um, birds. He said, oh, birds? Mm, what are they like? Well, they're colorful, they fly around. Okay. They've got wings. Okay. What else did you see? He said, well, there was something they called cows. Now, they're much bigger than birds, and they're brown ones and black ones and huge, and they've got horns and they munch grass and they carry pink plastic bags with milk between their legs. 
really? He said, that's amazing. Anything else you saw? Well, he said, well, the, the strangest thing really out there, they call people. The, the big ones and small ones, and they put funny stuff on themselves. And they walk on their hind legs. So that night, the, uh, the fish couldn't sleep for a long time. And uh, when he did sleep, he started dreaming. OK, so here's your task. Can you visualize for a moment what our friend the fish saw in his dreams? Just try to. You don't have to close your eyes, but if it helps, do. Can you imagine what he saw? Michel? OK. <laughs> OK, maybe you saw something like this. And when I do this in a workshop, there's always a group who does this. And they're very happy. And I'm very happy because this is beautiful. <laughs> but then we get a very interesting discussion going because then there's something like this. <laughs> so what's going on? And then invariably, through creative thinking as well as critical thinking, people say, well, hang on. This guy's never left the water. He only knows what a fish knows. Maybe you saw the old plastic bag or floating around. But, you know, it's a fishy world. He can only imagine what he has experienced and what he has been exposed to. So this is really a parable about perception. By the way, the good news is this book by Leo Leone you can buy in, I don't know, 30 languages. It's beautiful. And fish is fish and all the other ones. And uh, it's a parable about the limits of our perception. It's a children's book, but I always thought, no, it isn't. Um, and the, the story of what goes on, you know, the fish wants to leave the water to understand, and it's not a good idea. And I let you find out what the end of the story is. But basically, for me, because I have a deep interest in, in, in the cultural side of things through the training that I do, I usually take it then to have you had any fishy experiences when you were abroad, when you were out of Hungary? And there's a whole range of things that come up from, you know, not having the kind of bread that Hungarians like, or, you know, there's no real lunch in the UK when I was there with a the host family, <laughs> and all sorts of things. And then we kind of trace back to why is, is that them or you? So, and we get to a different kind of critical thinking which makes a connection in terms of intercultural learning between the other and the self, which to me lies at the heart of that understanding. And I would like Gubby to be able... Fish is fish. Fish is fish, yes. That's the title. <laughs> to shift perspective, We've had a rather impressive um, demonstration by Maria Zufi about the, the statistics, really, um, of the reality of our countries. And whatever is happening in Hungary now, I don't think Hungary, I mean, Hungary is not monocultural, for crying out loud. Uh, but in many of our schools in, in Budapest and in the country have an enormous share now of Chinese students, Vietnamese students, some from Arab countries. So the issue of relating to people from a different background means that you have to be able to see that your point of view is valid, but so is somebody else's. And if you truly want to understand them, you have to make a shift, which is not easy. Basically, instead of insisting that you see it right, and they see it wrong, and they should be changing, you've got to do something else. What I found interesting, this is actually not in a, a new idea, but NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, many years ago, was working with uh, the three perceptual positions, which are very close to what I think. This kind of, uh, what is it, thinking implies. And the people working on this were saying you need, this is the, your position, this is the other position, and you need to do the sort of the uh, Munchausen thing, kind of pulling yourself out of the mud 
and uh, to take on what they call the helicopter view. And the helicopter view actually means you don't just, first of all, you try to understand where they are coming from. English has that nice expression. I can see where you're coming from. If they really can see that, that's already a big step forward. Uh, but it also means to get us an eye on process. So think about some of the conflicts you have in your families. Very often, you end up in a tennis match simply because you, nobody makes that move to the top, to the helicopter view. Looking at, what are we doing here? What's going on? Why are we going so upset? How, how can we move forward? Yeah, that means a conscious move out of position one and two. Daniel Goleman, too, I found out recently, and I, I, it's another nice take from a different angle, in a book called Focus, actually talks of different uh, foci of attention. There's inner, and there's outer, and there's other. So this would be inner, other, outer. So again, you consciously, and I like that because it, it, it does tell you that this doesn't come easy. You need to make a cognitive and emotional effort to, to move into a different position so you see things differently and you can respond to the challenge of that argument or whatever it was uh, in that communication productively. And I think unless Gabi learns that, words like negotiating or communication skills make very little sense because they, are, they remain just labels and words. They don't get into why it is so difficult to do this. The last one, systems thinking. Now, systems thinking doesn't sound very sexy. I mean, it's <laughs> systems. Who's interested in systems? <laughs> Maybe you are. Uh, but systems, because it has a ring to it of computer systems, managerial systems, you name it. But this is different. It goes back to how I started, really, that we all are, socially speaking, part of an intricate web of relationships that behave systematically. But again, we're not usually aware of that because we are in it. Uh, we are part of a part of the system and we very rarely get a sense of where the relationship lies and exactly what consequences some of our actions have. Now, to just to make that a little bit more real, I thought schools would be a good place to, to look at. Um, so this is a, a nondescript school yard, playground maybe. But if you think with me for a moment, Schools are incredible sites. They're actually small and contained, but very rich in social relationships, intricately linked with each other. Whether it's the playground, the cafeteria, the classroom, the loose, everything plays out and very often is connected. Now I'm going to show you an extract from a student um, interview and I would like you to, to raise your hand when you think you know what this is about. Okay, so this is good. You don't have to do anything but raise your hand. No talking. But I'd like to see your hands. Okay? A few hands going up. Good. Yeah. I mean, obviously, none of this was meant. Seriously. Yeah, bullying. Yeah. Um, which is perhaps a, one of the most difficult and, and harmful outgrowths of these intricate webs of relationships. Um, and they're largely invisible to us as, as outsiders. We only, as teachers and sometimes even as peers, see very late what's happening. Uh, this is and the consequences of, of bullying. This is something that Peter Sange called um, system blindness. So it doesn't just relate to bullying, but I think bullying brings it home to you. 
and I'm sure many of you have had uh, cases of bullying to deal with. So there's a blindness from the point of view of the, of the outsider because only way late do we find out what's going on. But also there's a blindness very often on the part of the insider, the people involved in the bullying process. So if you look at this, it's what he calls unintended consequences. And I would give her that. So maybe they didn't mean to be what they were, but just a bit of fun. And then you can see, this is nice, inverted commas, we all, we've got your, the affinity bias again, playing a part here. So we all, and she's not sure, or perhaps not all, at all sure, about what these things mean to someone who has been bullied. A bit heavy. Yeah. None of it was meant seriously. But it is serious. This is the, a transcript from somebody who has been bullied. And I think one of the things that we're seeing more often, and it's interesting that it's international, sadly, um, you know, the unintended consequences playing out way later, all the way down to the kinds of shoes, school shootings um, that, we, that we have heard so much about in many of our countries, not just the States, and other forms of violence. And in part, maybe this is exacerbated by the fact that socially we haven't really evolved fast enough, whereas our technolo technological tools have. It's just incredible. I'm just seeing Maria Louise, you know, do this thing with the, uh, the smartphones and the possibilities, they grow exponentially from year to year. And with it, the potential for consequences that you just don't foresee, positively or negatively. Now, before I become, we become too self-righteous, I would like to talk a different kind of system, blindness, which um, I'm sure you also can relate to. Because we are also, all of us, part of a planetary system. And something that got a bit more news recently, which I'm happy about, is the issue of plastic bags. And what they're doing to all the uh, animals in the oceans, but not just there. Yeah, this is right here in Austria, and of course Hungary, and many other places. And it's finally, you know, they have the saying in English, what goes around comes around, down the food chain. It's getting back to us, okay? So I would like Gabi to, to develop a sort of, I don't, wouldn't like her to just have some sort of nondescript skill, but to see and feel and care about the connectedness of what she does as a consumer, for example. And I still find that incredible when I talk to my own students how little there is of this. And it's, none of this is, un, is, is intended, there's no ill will, it's just, oh yeah, never thought about that. That really, systems sinking in our societies means we're more like a spider's web, where anything you do here or here or here impacts on everything else. So will Gabi be, in that sense, a critically thinking person? And maybe also somebody, because that's the other side to system blindness and how to overcome it, maybe to become a critical agent. Somebody also sees, as I've come to believe, you know, beyond all the recycling that we do, we need systemic change if the 21st century is meant to be a livable century. So will she become a change agent and actually, you know, get at policy makers? She will need a lot of communication skills for that. All right, before I become too heavy. So let me just, by way of summarize, leave you with four tips. Okay, I've tweaked it a bit. It's not really working, but can you, do you still remember? The big picture. The big picture. Nice. And? 
very good. Easy one. And think systems. So it seems to me that in terms of the skills that we have, they're, they're fine. I think they're useful as labels. But if we can ourselves and also work with our students in a way that we make this zooming movement, we can go a long way to really enabling Gabi to deal with this century. I would like to believe it's possible and it's been very heartening to be with you and to see this great start of the conference. So I'm looking forward to getting more inspiration on this topic. Thank you very much. Okay.